TV stations, gavel, everybody good to go? Good morning, everyone. We're pleased to be here today for the Alaska House Majority Coalition Press Availability. With approximately two weeks out of the 90-day session, um, things are beginning to take shape <clears throat> in a major way. Yesterday, the uh, House passed the operating budget, uh, albeit by a pretty slim margin, but we did get the operating budget uh, through the House and it's uh, en route to the Senate. Uh, <clears throat> we're looking at um, holding a, a joint session for uh, confirmations um, next week. Uh, we don't have the date uh, pinned down, but that should take place sometime next week. And a lot of other um, actions um, and activity taking place in the, the committees and uh, both the House and the Senate. And with me this morning, I'm very pleased to be joined by the co-chairs of the House Finance Committee, Representative Neil Foster from Nome, Representative Paul Seaton from Homer, and our Fisheries Committee Chairman and Majority Whip, Representative Stutes out of Kodiak. And with that brief opening, I think I'll turn things over to you, Representative Seaton. Well, thank you. Uh, very pleased that we got the um, budget uh, out. Um, very strong uh, working uh, time was taken to get compromise solutions so that we could go forward with the budget. Uh, I think the budget is very good for Alaska. Uh, it had a number of uh, items in it that are very helpful to making sure that public safety, education, university uh, can operate well for the people of the state of Alaska. And, uh, you know, we used a subcommittee process that was very open. Every single amendment that came forward was publicly vetted, publicly voted on, and debated. And so I think that we came out with a really good product that represents the diversity of our caucus and the diversity of the entire House. Representative Foster. Yes, thank you, um, Rep or Speaker. Um, and I just wanted to underscore uh, one thing that kept coming up, and that was uh, that we weren't uh, doing enough to uh, make cuts. And um, I just wanted to remind folks that uh, since we started, the legislature started making cuts um, uh, in 2015, the budget's been cut by 20, uh, by 30 percent. And so, um, you know, I've always said we've cut a lot of the fat away, and we're starting to cut into bone, and um, and it's just not sustainable. And so. That's why our uh, caucus has been so focused on trying to come up with a long-term sustainable fiscal plan, and we're going to continue on that path. So, thank you. Representative Stutes. Oh, thank you. Well, uh, <clears throat> good morning. I'm pretty excited to be here, as today we're going to be rolling out our CS on House Bill 199, which is the Habitat Bill. We'll be rolling that out in fisheries. It's going to be, um, it's, a, it's a good bill. I know how critically important salmon is to the communities I represent, Kodiak, Cordova, Yakutat, several small villages, coastal villages, fishing villages, and how important it is to our state. This is, um, it's a, a good, solid, pro-fishery, anti, uh, it is not anti-development. We've taken great strains over the last few months to work with all the stakeholders and um, all, all of the industries involved to come up with a good document. And I'm feeling pretty happy about this. So I'm looking forward to rolling out 199. Well, that gets us to the Q&A portion. And as always, please identify yourself and your affiliation. Becky Bohr with the Associated Press. For Speaker Edgman, maybe first, the governor says that there are talks with lawmakers on some sort of um, end of session package. Um, can you speak to um, any must haves? Um, you know, you guys have been talking about compromise, but any must haves, I guess, for your caucus? And what specifically do you think it's going to take to get a CBR vote um, from your minority? So, like we said at the outset, we're a couple weeks away from the 90-day um, end of session mark. Um, I think there's, you know, the clear reality is that we're probably going to go over. Um, but uh, I, I can say that the House, the Senate, the Governor, all of the sort of uh, uh, teams, if you will, the leadership teams have been uh, laser-like focused on uh, uh, getting our work done as soon as possible. Um, uh, relative to uh, you know that 90-day mark, and uh, we've had a number of discussions getting the operating budget uh, passed the House uh, yesterday removed a large obstacle to sort of opening up the door to those conversations, 
And uh, clearly, the, the, the must-have above all is the, uh, the operating budget. Uh, we're, we're constantly required to, to uh, pass that. And uh, so that's the, the primary focus amidst uh, a lot of other uh, uh, priorities. And uh, uh, where we end up in terms of those priorities, I think, uh, you know, the next um, a week or two or uh, hopefully not too much long after that will, will, will you know, tell us uh, where we're at at that time. This is for, I think, I think Representative Seaton. Um, uh, the governor earlier today, as much as the governor freaks out, which is not very much, um, <laughs> said, said he kind of freaked out with the $2,700 dividend or the full dividend. You don't really freak out very much yourself, at least in public. Um, but were you freaked out by the size of the, that first dividend that lasted five days? Well, um, obviously, the House Finance um, passed out a 1,258 uh, and a 4.75% draw. We were looking at long-term sustainable draw and a long-term split. Uh, so we were setting up that um, to say, what can we do over the long term? Um, I don't believe that um, hardly anybody recognized uh, thought that a $2,700 dividend was sustainable over the long term. Uh, our frustration, and I think some of our members' frustration, was without any new revenue, without a comprehensive fiscal plan, um, having all of the re revenue or all of the change come from a, a reduction from the historic formula um, was inappropriate. So I think that... Um, uh, in the end, everybody realized that we need something that's sustainable. Uh, the um, Permanent Fund Corporation has said five and a quarter percent is is doable for a few years. Um, it's really not the long-term sustainable amount. That's somewhere between 4.75 and 5 percent uh, of a percent of market draw from the Permanent Fund. And so I think that those conversations are going forward. <coughs> and... Um, we're uh, in that dual problem of saying, how do, you, how do you balance your budget? And if you don't have revenues, uh, it's really hard to balance your budget. And so that's why we have looked at last year, you know, took some really tough votes. Um, all the members of our caucus saying, we really need to fix the problem. And that was the four pillars of the plan that we came up with, a broad-based tax, uh, oil taxes and, and credit reform, <coughs> as well as you know, maintaining a permanent fund dividend structure for sure and, and smart budget cuts. So we believe that we're looking at those, but um, some of those need to be tied together. So you did freak out. Uh, I, I don't uh, say that I freak out. I mean, I didn't consider it a uh, sustainable move, and I've always um, supported a sustainable fiscal plan. And so uh, at that point in time, the discussions and the compromises came through. And, and I think that we landed on a very good target at, at 1,600 that is uh, workable with a five and a quarter percent draw from the um, permanent fund earning reserve. And uh, so that's. Well, you know, and one thing I would add, uh, Rich, is that we knew that we were going to have uh, a struggle with uh, <coughs> the permanent fund dividend and the size and amendments on the floor. Uh, we didn't expect it to be an easy process. Uh, there were many legislators who felt that it should have been the smallest number. There were some who felt it should have been the middle. And there were a number of us, including uh, myself and Representative Foster, who voted for a full PFD that... Uh, uh, given the uh, current uh, conditions with the earnings of uh, the fund itself, that uh, we might be able to have a, 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 a afford a full PFD for this one year. But like I've said at uh, previous press events, um, I've been pretty candid with my constituents, telling them that, um, you know, if we did ha get to a full uh, permanent fund dividend this year, fully funded, which we now know is off the table, the support clearly isn't there, that in the long run, it couldn't be sustainable because you'd be overdrawing the fund and you'd be endangering uh, our ability to pay for essential services, which is now what we're asking the permanent fund uh, to do. But uh, I'll just uh, end by saying what I said, uh, I think it was last week, that uh, the vote on the House floor definitely was a watershed moment. 21 uh, members on the prevailing side, 19 on the opposing side, and you had uh, members from both caucuses, both political parties on, on each side of that vote. 
And um, so I guess the, the, the question uh, going forward is, um, you know, is, is, uh, is, is uh, the rest of the state, uh, you know, also coming to the realization that we have to use the earnings reserve of the permanent fund? Um, maybe, maybe not. But uh, I think the outcome of a $1,600 dividend sort of strikes the middle balance. And um, my hope is that the Senate can support that and uh, the governor as well. Uh, Steve Quinn, KTBA News. I've got uh, two budget-related questions. The first, uh, in House Finance, you pick up the, uh, the employment tax uh, connected to the capital budget. What are your thoughts on that, please? Uh, yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, at this point, um, we haven't focused on, on that payroll tax, 1.5% uh, payroll tax, um, and, uh, and it doesn't seem like there's a lot of interest out there, um, both at the House and the Senate level. Um, I think, um, and, and without that, um, the capital contingency, can, we're calling that the contingent capital uh, fund, um, that's without that being tied to the, the payroll taxes the governor has asked for, um, that of course won't go through. And so we will need to start looking at pieces of that, that our caucus and that the Senate would like to bring over into the normal capital budget. So, um, so that's what will happen with that. And I just might add that <clears throat> there is concern about using um, one of your strongest tools, that is a broad-based tax, for not doing anything to balance the budget. In other words, all of those funds are something that's important, which is deferred maintenance, but um, you know, not being able to be a contributor to balancing the budget defs, you know, doesn't fill the deficit at all because it all went to capital. Um, that takes that tool away from uh, the legislature to be able to use for balancing the budget. My other question related to um, the fiscal plan is the, the governor's uh, proposal to pay down the tax credits um, selling bonds. I know it's not in your committee just yet, <coughs> but um, you know we've heard that this is part of a bigger plan. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on, on that process and that proposal? Well, we haven't had it uh, in our committee yet, so uh, it's hard to say definitively because we've just heard outlines. Um, and so I really wouldn't want to say too much about that. You know, there is a problem um, that many people express about bonding uh, for uh, payments basically to oil companies. Uh, we, ha we do have a structure in the statute that says that you know 10 percent of the production tax that we receive should go into the fund to pay those credits uh, there's a dispute over what that really means what revenue means uh, uh, unfortunately the department of revenue is saying well we're not going to talk about revenue that's money we receive we're going to talk about uh, a tax calculation before the oil companies subtract their per barrel credits, which means that you'd be taking 60% of all your production tax revenue and paying it out for credits. So that's a problem in that structure. Uh, but the structure of saying we're going to convert this debt, and it is a, something we owe, uh, based on a formula that says a percentage of what we receive in oil production tax credits will pay those to a formula that says we're going to bond and have these hard payments due in future legislatures no matter what we receive from oil taxes uh, is a um, quite a different structure and there are some challenges with that. Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Radio Network. 